Thank you to the um, speaker, uh, the um, organisers for this invitation. Uh, as you've already worked out by now, I'm Rodney Reed. I'm the uh, head of the environment component of GIZ, uh, which is uh, in German it would be German Technical Development, and uh, we are part of a project called Promotion of Social and Environmental Standards. Uh, GIZ has been in Bangladesh since the mid 1970s. Uh, we have projects in a whole variety of areas uh, from coastal livelihood, health, um, prison reform, and now textiles and leather. So today I want to talk about water. I want to talk about water between the bale and the rail. So between the cotton bale and the garment rail. And the garment rail could either be in a textile or in a, a garmenting store in Europe or North America, or it could be the, uh, the rail of the Almira in a customer's home in, um, in the UK. I won't spend much time talking about PSES, Promotion of Social and Environmental Standards, because there are these leaflets on the, um, on the reception desk. So if you're interested to know more about this, uh, that's where you'll find the detail. We have, there are three things we do. Uh, the whole purpose of our work in Bangladesh and in the, uh, the cotton sector, the cotton value added sector, is productivity and skills development. And I should say at the beginning of this that uh, GIZ promotion of social and environmental standards would be very pleased to be much more closely involved with BTA, uh, with the um, Bangladesh Cotton Association and the Textile Mills Association because we focus really in the middle of the supply chain uh, or the value added chain, not the whole of it. So we have three things we do. One is social standards, uh, environment standards, and inclusive skills development. And the, the, over, the, the purpose is overall economic, social, and environmental sustainability of Bangladesh's textile and leather industries. Now because we are uh, funded by the German government, we don't sell consultancy services, we don't sell training. Uh, we provide capacity building, we train uh, service providers who might be freelance consultants, might be consulting firms, we work with trade associations and we work with representatives from factories to enable them to deliver services uh, going forward. So three components. Uh, today we'll focus here on this one here which is environmental standards and I say my interest is the whole uh, is from cotton arriving in a bale to it going out on a clothing rail. So these are three components. The inclusive skills development component is uh, was part of our response to Rana Plaza and it was about rehabilitating injured workers, finding work for them, uh, but now it's about getting people with disabilities involved in productive work. So we find that people who are uh, not fully uh, met, uh, physically able uh, they make very good employees, and so with some support and some training, uh, then we help. Uh, looking into the Buraganga, I think we'd be hard pressed to say those rivers are blue. But if, the, if it's possible to reuse water, or to take water from the surface, then that would be blue water. Now there's also a third kind of water that I'll, ex I'll begin to explain these as we go through the presentation. There's grey water. Now grey water, it's water that's either started off as green or blue and has been used but could be used again. Now, there's a, an organization and you can see the, um, the website there called the Water Footprint Network, water, waterfootprint.org. Now, the, as well as looking to see how we can use less water, what's important to realize is that the garment brands who are buying finished garments in Bangladesh are interested in the water footprint and at some point in the future the, there will be a request to say how much water was used in the production of a garment work uh, for other countries as well. So green water that's come from the rain, uh, blue water is what's on the surface which would be river water, pond water and I suppose if you capture rainwater in a pool becomes, turns from green to blue, but it's still water that didn't wash grey water, and then there's grey water. Now I understand that in Bangladesh most of our water used in the 
cotton value added chain comes from two wells. So nearly all of it is groundwater, and we all of us know that the aquifer under Dhaka and under, under Narangaj is depleting in a way that cannot be sustained, maybe uh, three meters a year every year. And whereas those of us who run factories can simply drill deeper and deeper tube wells, uh, the people in the slums, the people in the villages with hand pumps just won't be reaching water. So that's briefly. I want to talk now about green, blue, and gray water optimizing in cotton manufacturing. So I talked about the three elements, the green, blue, and gray, and from the, from the bale to the rail, and about slowing the flow using less water. Now I also understand, because uh, I've, I've been in Bangladesh for a long time, that the spinning mill operation is not using much water in the same way that a garment factory doesn't use much water. But spinning mills and, gar and RMG factories have workers. Workers wash their hands. Workers go to the toilet. And a, and a, a dry process factory can waste a lot of water in sanitary use. And there are simple ways to, to cut that back in terms of aerating taps, um, wash basin taps that have got spring-loaded uh, fastening so that they turn themselves off. Uh, dual flush toilets. Now, as we become come into an era, and I'll talk about water scarcity, as water becomes more scarce in Bangladesh, every part of the cotton value added chain will need to look at how to minimize the amount of water being taken. So a spinning mill, um, not much water consumed in the process, but a significant amount through workers and through sanitary use, same with RMG. I said that one thing that we believe is coming into the garment sector, and will not be long before it comes into Bangladesh, is garment brands saying, what's the water footprint? Now this is the, the other thing we think will come before too long, the concept of a water budget. When a, a major garment brand says, we are not prepared to have more than this amount of water used in making a pair of jeans, a shirt, a uh, polo top, whatever it is. And they won't be interested just in what's happening in the RMG factory or what's happening in the, um, uh, the dyeing the dye house. They'll be interested in all of the process. So that's why I'm interested today to talk to a seminar that's apparently got mainly, uh, that I knew would have mainly people who were from the, the cotton mill end of the operation, but I think all of you have got overlaps into other trade, other the interest of the other trade sections, BGMEA, BKMEA, you've got integrated mills, they're not simply a spinning mill or a dye house or an RMG unit. So the, there is, I believe that we will come to a time when we may be required to minimize the water because there will be a water budget that's set for us. So that that will be a, a brand saying this is the amount we're prepared to see used. Now there is also upcoming impacts at some point in Bangladesh when the aquifer drops continues to drop the DOE may be required to act to license two wells and to put a cost on raw water. So you then have a situation where uh, at the moment water is apparently free, okay there's pumping costs and there are uh, process costs in moving it, heating, cleaning, but water could become expensive. And also there could be an actual charge going forward for um, water leaving either your sewage plant on your factory site or your effluent treatment plant, the amount of water being discharged. So we're looking to a time when there could well be um, water would be more expensive in Bangladesh to a time when brands might be saying, this is the amount we're prepared to see used for our garments and no more and a possible time when uh, there simply won't, will not be enough water. This is the idea of a water management process. So we start, oops, we start off with the idea of assessing how much water has been used, considering all the uses of water. Now, one thing I should also say is that this morning I've heard a lot of people saying, uh, uh, the presenters and the audience saying about energy, that energy is your key concern, the cost of energy, gas prices increasing, the cost of generating electricity from gas, 
your on-site generation. Now, the, these principles also apply in energy. So assessment, uh, the data gathering, the costing, the reporting, the recovery, and the uh, future savings. It's looking at considering that water as a, as a resource that needs to be managed, or energy as a resource that needs to be managed. I'm regularly surprised when I visit um, factories in all parts of the, the cotton value and the cotton production process about how few meters there are, that how, how few factories know exactly how much water is being used, how much um, thermal energy, how much steam is being used, or how much electricity is being used, or the factories know it at a department level or a factory-wise level, but not by machine, by process, so that uh, we're using en electrical energy in a way that we can't quite control because we don't really know. And there's a saying that if you can't measure it, you can't manage it. So in, uh, electri ele in the electrical savings, the need for electrical audits, gathering data about having metered data, calculating the cost. Now here this is about water, but it works exactly the same way with electricity. Assessment, data gathering, costing, the cost of, for me here, the water, then reporting that, making sure that those who are in control of the factory have all the information they need, and then for water, begin to reduce the cost of water by recovering it. Now if I use um, an energy example, uh, it's, it's not possible in the same way you can reuse water, but you can reuse the energy you've, you've, you've burned. For example, if you have a generator or a boiler, okay, if you've got cogeneration, you're making electricity and steam at the same time, but very often uh, boilers and generators have got hot flue gas, four or five hundred degrees of heat being wasted into the atmosphere. That can be used for um, exhaust gas boilers, it can be used for uh, heat recovery, and also uh, there's, you, can, you can recover energy from the hot water that would usually be wasted in generator, ex uh, generator jackets or, uh, or um, just cooling water uh, that's gone through a, a garmenting process. So the, the, this principle works for energy as it works for water, and the concept is about future savings that I talk to factory owners about setting energy budgets, setting water budgets for a department. Rather than saying at the end of the month we know how much energy we use and we can work it back to how much energy per uh, tonne of cloth or per <coughs> thousand dozen pieces. It's actually going forward saying to the department managers, this is the budget you can spend this month staying within this rate. Or saying to the um, production workers, this is the target for your floor this month in terms of energy and water. So that's the, the concept of water management. Now we know in Bangladesh this will be the reality, that there will be water scarcity. We know that in the, the northern part of the country, Bangladesh is becoming more arid, that our, our regional neighbours uh, there's not as much water coming into Bangladesh from the north as there used to be. Then there's a situation on the south of the country where salt water is moving further inland. But now, and going into the future, we have a situation where there's, there is now and will be a stronger competition for water, for agricultural water, for drinking water, so what we call sanitary water, and and industrial process water. So now there is water scarcity and we know that in other neighboring countries, for example India, at the central and south of India this month has a water crisis. Now Bangladesh in a country that appears to have a great deal of water may well end up in a position where there's not enough. Now it's our informal estimate that there is not enough water in Bangladesh to meet the $50 billion target. If we use as much water to turn raw cotton into garments as we do at the moment, there isn't enough water available to do that and make $50 billion. Because the aquifer is depleting, 
the rivers are polluted, rainwater harvesting will help. My point for the whole sector is that unless we as a, as a full sector from raw cotton to garments consider how we will minimize the water use and even small, small users, the spinning mill, garment factory, we need to look at minim minim minimizing our use of water if we're going to be able to get to the $50 billion target. Or, I'm, I visit mills now where they're closed a day or two a week because there's not enough gas or so the gas pressure is too low. Imagine a situation where the factory can't run because there's not enough water. And that's the reality. And also, as we begin to put in more and more dying units, uh, more, more mills that require, we're not buying as much cloth, then the demand for water goes up and our availability of water and gas is going down. There, I've already said that there's a, a, a well-known saying that what you can't, what you don't measure, you can't manage. If you don't know what's happening, uh, you can't measure it. Again, I'm always surprised to go through mills of any of it, of, 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 of to go through the to, to go through factories then at various stages of the garment making process or the household textiles process or denim manufacture to find very few meters or to find if there are meters there's not enough to, to, to draw a water balance or not enough in fact to do an electricity balance, an energy balance across the factory. And if there are meters, they're very often this kind of meter where you've got you've got to send a, an operator with a clipboard to take the meter reading um, once a day, twice a day, take it back, enter it to a spreadsheet and then produce some numbers from it. So even if you have enough meters, there's time, human time involved and also the risks of mistakes if someone puts a zero in the wrong place or decides to write the reading down and not go. So it's important to be able to control your use of energy or our use of water to be measuring. But there is a much smarter way of doing this. Now, I should say that the, the, the next few slides are from a, an Australian company. Now, GIZ is not recommending this company. All we've done is to ask them for permission to use their slides. So, if uh, it's about, this, is, this is now about intelligent metering. Now, the concept is this would be uh, in the chief executive's office, the factory general manager's office, um, corporate office, there could be a computer screen with a dashboard that shows you how much water is being used. As I've said, the same method applies with electrical energy or thermal energy. You can have these smart meters fitted across your factory site and these, these metering units report back to a control unit and then report back th through the internet to using software to analyze and show you how much use. Now this uh, example is with cables, but it's, it's easily possible to do this on a wireless basis. So you have energy meters, whether it's steam or electricity, water meters across the factory that then with wireless technology uh, feed information to a, a central control unit and then puts the information on a... See, that's a, that's a better example. That is the kind of thing that smart technology will give you for energy, for water, on, on the, the factory manager's desk, on the accounts desk in the corporate office. It will, it will give good real-time readings of what's happening. It's also possible to measure uh, pollution with remote sensing, sensing on the same basis. So this is the the dashboard that you would get uh, from a meter like this one. So a meter that could be anywhere in the factory site or any uh, meters that would feed back through this kind of equipment would give you real-time readings on energy and water use. So my point is if you want to make best use of energy and water and control the use, then smart metering is the way to go. And there are numbers of companies that offer this as an option uh, the Swedish Textile Water Initiative was doing sea scarcity coming and water scarcity coming, metering 
and then budgeting becomes important. And thinking about raw water minimizing, one is to reduce, another is to reuse, and a third is to recover. And there is now the opportunity for each, for effluent treatment plant outflow to be recycled into process. I've seen effluent treatment plants that have a few percent has come back into the factory for floor washing, for toilet washing. This recovery technology has between maybe 40 and 60 percent of the water brought back into the process. And some of the big brands are beginning to say that what percentage of raw water 